I'd like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me to speak today. It's a true honor to be here, and I'm so excited that Dr. Hong and the, the CARE team has decided to um, embrace this um, sort of fight to eliminate the disparity in, in gastric cancer. And, um, and I would be very, very happy if we could prevent and detect gastric cancer very early and if ESD was the treatment of choice for our patients. Because I'll, I don't know if you can see, um, there's a little bit of a discrepancy in the, uh, the pamphlet versus the program. I'm not talking about CTDNA um, maybe in three years after our, our grant projects get finished, but um, okay. So the role of surgery in the treatment of um, early gastric cancer in the United States, I cut out early because um, as we were speaking, and you know that early gastric cancer in the United States is very few and far between, and that's very unfortunate. Very few cases of ESD and very few cases of cure. Um, these are my disclosures, and I just wanted to let you know who I am. I'm a 1.5 generation Korean American. This is gastric cancer in the Korean American community. I grew up in New Jersey with very high incidence of gastric cancer um, among our um, immigrant population. Um, it is very important to me, and it's been a fight that I've been involved in for um, maybe five, six years. Um, but I went to Korea for a fellowship. They said, if you come back with a robotic gastric cancer fellowship, you'll never have a job, but I have a job. Um, and <laughs> I'm doing pretty well. But I will tell you that it is a challenge, yeah, uh, because cancer biology and surgical technology, and as a surgeon, um, we are, I'm at the crossroads of all, incorporating all of these things for, our gastric, for the gastric cancer patients. But the, it, the answer is very simple. For early stage gastric cancer, resection is curative. We can cure gastric cancer if we can find gastric cancer patients at a very early stage. I can cure gastric cancer. Dr. Hong can cure the gastric cancer. Dr. Lin and Ido, my colleagues from City of Hope, they would love to cure gastric cancer. But the fact is that in the United States, we don't have that much early gastric cancer, and most of the patients that I see at City of Hope are very advanced stage. And it is, gastric cancer is a discussion amongst um, surgi surgical oncologists and medical oncologists and palliative care service. And so it takes the entire dialogue of gastric cancer out of early um, diagnosis and cure into a more, very, very complicated um, a formidable challenge disease. Um, and surgery plus all other therapies to date for advanced gastric cancer and stage four gastric cancer is not enough. We cannot cure um, most of our advanced gastric cancer patients and definitely not our stage four gastric cancer patients. Um, our incidence is low, but we have advanced stage of disease and we know that we are doing badly, maybe not compared to China, or the rest of the world in some, and this is how you analyze data, in some rest of the world, US is doing fairly well, 31% five-year survival, but that's horrible. If you can reach 67% with screening, then why are we still at 31% and why are gastric cancer patients dying? So it, it adversely impacts the world with one million cancer diagnosis of stomach cancer a year, but it adversely impacts our patients in the United States, and especially in California. We heard about um, the mecca of sort of like the uh, UN of the world being here um, in Northern California, but so one of the reasons I moved to Southern California is because of high incidence of gastric cancer um, and the disparity that exists among not just Asian Americans, but also young Hispanic Americans as well. So you'll notice that this is um, the data from the Ca California Cancer Registry that my um, statistician and fellow worked on to see that even among age groups, and you can see that stage four gastric cancer exists in young patients, but disproportionately, and that um, most of our patients are being diagnosed in stage three and four. 
And so this means, this is not just the disease of elderly, even though we know that over time, you know, the risk of getting gastric cancer in, uh, in Asian men, uh, Korean American men, supersede and go higher at 65. But if you look, there are other risk factors here that we have not found. And among Hispanic men um, under the age of 40, they're more, more likely to be diagnosed with stage four gastric cancer uh, than others. So it also adversely impacts my patient population at City of Hope. At City of Hope, we see about 80 to 100 gastric cancer patients a year. I wish that they were all early gastric cancer patients, and you know, Dr. Lenidos and I can share our patients, but most of these patients are not, uh, uh, by and large, 50% are diagnosed at advanced stages, meaning only 15% or early cancers that could be absolutely cured, and these resectable advanced gastric cancer patients are undergoing chemotherapy, they're undergoing clinical trials, um, and 35% are seen by our medical oncologists um, and Dr. Joseph Chow, who uh, takes care of them, but surgery plays a little role and there's little cure. This, even though we have great new therapies out there, um, I'll show you the data is increments and in months of improved survival. And so for our patients, 75% are robotic and 20% open and 5% lap. How many surgeons are out there is probably the surgical portion is gonna put you to sleep. But I'll do a case presentation of a very classic patient, um, a 28 year old Caucasian woman, two children, family history of gastric cancer, mother, grandfather, and lobular breast cancer, maternal aunt, uh, found to have positive CDH1 mutation. This person comes to me and I'm very happy to see her because in this patient, I can cure her if her endoscopy is negative and her biopsies are negative or they're early stage. And you know, she went for her surveillance EGD, they were positive findings on the biopsy, unfortunately. But when we did the surgery, um, and she recovered very well. Her entire stomach was removed. And uh, people ask me, and this is a difficult discussion, so this is one page, but the discussion with these patients are very long. They know they're gonna get gastric cancer or they have gastric cancer. It's, a, it's not a difficult decision to make to lose your stomach, to live forever without cancer. Um, versus the alternative is to definitely die from stomach cancer, uh, but it's not an easy decision to make. Some people are very attached to their stomachs, and when, as a surgeon, I say I'm gonna remove it, um, it takes some time, but this is the opportunity. If you know the risk, then you can have that discussion with, your, with my patient, with your patient, and say, if you can lose your stomach, but you can live without cancer, by and large, most patients will give up their stomach. So this patient, this risk of CDH1 mutation is, is um, I'm sorry that people have to have it, but if you could find it, if we have a risk that we can find to define um, the cure, then it should be done. So this patient has a surgical cure. So then another very typical patient, about 50% plus, maybe 75 this, by this, with the analysis of this year's patient population, um, we have an Asian American patient uh, percentage of uh, over 50%. And a classic patient presentation is like, 52 year old Korean American man, works in K-Town, presents to his PMD with persistent nausea, epigastric pain, denies weight loss, melana. Um, he's form born, has a long H. pylori history. He, um, you know, he follows some of the Korean guidelines and goes to get random screening, he has a family history. I'm not sure if his GI or his PMD knows about Dr. Huang's uh, recommendations, but he does get some endoscopy, and he was found to have uh, atrophic gastritis. Um, when his symptoms returned, he tried to get an endoscopy, but due to some financial reasons, he couldn't, and there was some delay. However, when he did go get his biopsy, he was found to have adenocarcinoma intestinal type, and after some workup, uh, we took him to surgery. Surgery w went very well, patient went home in five days, um, and he was found to have uh, T2N0 stage one 
disease, MSI high, now we know some patients don't need chemotherapy after their surgery or before, and this patient is most likely cured. If this returns, we also have a targeted therapy. Spend a lot of money at the end of the disease and not enough in the beginning. And so this is another presentation, 31-year-old Hispanic woman with no history of gastric cancer. By and large, if I, if, when I evaluate my data, Hispanic patients end up presenting at a later stage. Um, and there is a delay for some reason in their diagnosis. If this otherwise asymptomatic patient um, probably had symptoms um, if you asked enough. And that's why when, when I look at my data and says patient, uh, you know, all these histories that says, oh, they have no, they're asymptomatic. Well, they're not really asymptomatic. She's been having melanoma probably, dark school, but I've been taking iron because I was anemic. So two years go by and she presents with stage three disease. And this is a very common presentation of patients. Um, luckily, she, uh, she went under one neoadjuvant therapy. She had a fairly good response. Uh, she's unfor uh, she had, unfortunately, very little response to her chemotherapy, but downstaged. Um, there are no markers for her um, if she recurs, except to have continued chemotherapy and her risk of recurrence. So as a surgeon, do I, did I cure this patient? I did a surgery with curative intent, and she is without cancer today, but when will she recur? Her risk of recurrence is very high, and we haven't found anything um, really good to treat her with. So surgeon's goal is to cure, and actually surgeons have made some really good progress in this field um, to have patients live long and preserve quality of life. And as a robotic surgeon, that, that's what we pride ourselves on, that we will get the patients home quickly and they will do well. Um, and this is, you know, a century of work. 1881, open operation, we did it for like a century. Finally, minimally invasive came along, um, and now robotic surgery. The data is there, I'm not gonna bore you with it. Laparoscopy, minimally invasive surgery is not much better in terms of long-term survival uh, for our patients, but they definitely get home uh, quicker and less blood loss, um, and it's equivalent if you can do it. There's a bunch of data on safety and robotics, um, and uh, whether it's better or worse, and there's a lot of controversy about the cost of robotic surgery. So what I tell my patients is, um, you know, insurance covers it, don't worry, but the cost of robotic surgery for 10 people is probably less than a patient going through an entire end stage of chemotherapy. And so I think that discussion is mute. We should t talk about something else. If it gives you an advantage, I will use it, and it does. Um, there's some potential advantages that it would make Surgeons have lesser, less learning curves, it's better for the patient, improves lymph node dissection. We have new technology emerging that we can use. And regardless of what the debates are, there is a rise in robotic gastrectomy for cancer in the United States for sure. We are training for safe adoption. We published our textbook um, and, and we train our fellows we teach them how to do this. We present at SSO. We give courses at the American College of Surgeons. But what actually is the reality is that patients present with what we think that surgeons can cure, and what happens is this. We go in to do a curative surgery, and about 15 to 25% of our patients already have metastatic disease and I have nothing to offer these patients. Um, limited role for surgery, probably no surgical cure, or work, but even though we're working on it with HIPEC, PIPEC, a lot of new technologies and um, new um, agents. But you'll see that the increment of increase in life that we are able to afford for our patients over decades of um, research in chemotherapy and billions of dollars that we put in to improve the life and, and the length of life of our patients is dismal. Chemotherapeutic agents are buying us about 
six months, seven months, more than um, nothing at all. And even with our targeted therapies, we can add a few more months. Like Herceptin gives us 2.8 months survival benefit, 1.7 months. You know, I mean, checkpoint inhibitors, which is only useful in a handful of our patients. Um, but so there is, lies the problem. A ugly duckling who wants to do robotic gastric cancer surgery in the United States, but can't really find enough patients. Um, so can surgeons cure stomach cancer in the United States? Well, yes, and a very handful of few. Um, and maybe we'll be fighting for the, the early cancer patients with the interventional GI guys. Um, but no. Not a chance. <laughs> Unfortunately, and I'll be there if you guys make a hole if you need me to fix it. But you guys can fix <laughs> we that can fix too. Those so too. I know. <laughs> I don't know what to do anymore. Uh, I need to go back into research. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, most patients in the United States are diagnosed in more advanced stages, and surgery has a high failure rate. And so we need to not just look for ways to treat the recurrence, but prevent the cancer altogether. So I think it's time to act. We know that we can quantify risk for gastric cancer. This is only a very basic few things that are unmodifiable, modifiable. We have so many other tools and knowledge right now. Um, we can define the at-risk patient population. You'll hear much more about this. But we know that these things Native Koreans and Korean Americans in LA, um, their risk factors are there. Young Hispanic men, um, patients with CDH1 mutation, H. pylori infection, I can roll them off. I just don't know how to put all of these together in a statistical fashion to make a politician believe that it is a risk. Um, and I'll leave that up to the next speakers. Um, do we have enough data to support screening? I think this is a paper that uh, you guys wrote here. <laughs> um, it sounds like it's worth pursuing, um, and it may depend on who, what, and how we do it. So I request, and I'm so happy and very proud to be part of the actions that we're taking for collaboration to find a solution. I think we will find a solution soon as we work together, and these are my acknowledgments. Thank you very much.